We've been in a series of messages on uh, Harbor values. What are the, the values that we're uh, grasping hold of um, as, a, as a new church as we're emerging and becoming what God's calling us to be? And uh, we've been looking at those all through this summer. And uh, it's amazing to me, I realize how much scripture talks about what a church can be and what uh, a group of people following Jesus together can become uh, as we as we commit ourselves around God's word and we follow Jesus together. So today I want to uh, uh, have you turn in your Bibles to First Peter. It's a very small letter right towards the back of the Bible. Um, actually, you know, almost right at the back. And we're going to look at chapter two, and uh, it's a it's just a very significant and important uh, passage of scripture. So therefore. Rid yourselves of all malice and all deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander of every kind. Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. Now that you've tasted that the Lord is good. And come to him, the living stone, rejected by people, but chosen by God and precious to him. Then he says this, you also like living stones, are built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then skip down to um, verse 9. It talks about how different people have disobeyed. And then verse 9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you're the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I pray with me, please. Lord, thank you for this word and, uh, and the promises of what can happen as we, as we turn to you and we bring our sacrifices of praise and we lift you up. And, and so we come to you and your word today, and we pray that you would teach us and um, encourage us and build us into uh, your uh, holy, holy building, each of us living stones. That's our need today. That's our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I love this passage because it talks about some of the key things that go into um, becoming a church. And so for us, as a, a, a new, newly formed congregation that has no members, you know, we haven't gotten that far yet, <laughs> but, but we just have people who are following Jesus together and, and we're beginning to take shape together as a church. It's really important to go back to God's Word and find out what is it that, that He's calling us to be. And, and in this uh, passage, uh, there's, there's three parts to it. One is that there are certain behaviors, not that we're to do, like sometimes we think, well, if you go to church, you know, get your act together and do a bunch of things. Actually, it doesn't talk about that. It talks about stop doing this before anything. Stop doing this. There's behaviors to stop. And then it talks about our, what we believe and the result of that. And, and then it talks about what, what happens to us as we belong uh, together as, as God's people. So I want us to look at those, and um, the, when, when this starts out, let me give you a little ramp up. In the very end of chapter 1, he's talking about, uh, through Christ, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead, and you glorify him, so your faith and hope are in God. Now, now that you're purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers and sisters, love one another deeply from the heart. That call to love each other deeply from the heart then gets elaborated in the start of verse 2. If you're going to love one another deeply from the heart, therefore, rid yourselves of all malice, deceit, hypocrisy, envy, and slander. Now, I looked at those things, and I thought, these are probably the very things that most churches are accused of. Isn't that weird? When you think of church through 
the years, your own experience in church, my own experience in church, what is it that comes to mind? What was the church like? Well, you know, deceitful, hypocritical, uh, putting each other down. Oh my goodness, the very things that Scripture is saying, get rid of this. Why? Because it's those very things that most undermine loving relationships. If we're called to love each other deeply from the heart, it's these very things that erode that love, and, uh, and that's why it's so difficult for, for us as Christians to, and in churches to find authentic, loving community. Because we've not gotten rid of the lies, the phoniness, the jealousy, the putting people down, and, and that still is going on. Now, the, the phrase there, I love this, it's uh, rid yourself of this. And, and uh, in, in doing a little word study here, it's not just uh, uh, push it out of your life. The, the image that's used there is uh, taking off clothes or jackets or things like that and just dropping them. You know how, like, you know, when, uh, I'm not going to say you, but maybe someone near you and in, in your family might be, they're making their way to the shower or something, and they're just leaving their clothes as they go, you know, for someone else to pick up. <laughs> That's what this is saying. <laughs> Rid yourself of these things, because what it's, what it's implying is we have covered ourselves with envy and jealousy and phoniness, hypocrisy, you know, play acting, everything's great, yeah, it's fine, everything's super, and uh, these kinds of things, and we've put those over us until we become, remember that, that movie Christmas Story, I know this summer, I know this summer, but remember the movie Christmas Story, you know, you shoot your eye out, mm -hmm. yeah. classic, Remember when the younger brother was going out to play in the snow and they kept dressing him up with more and more things and they bundled him layers of clothes. You need layers to go out. And pretty soon he's like this. And he, he can't hardly walk or bend or turn. He's got so many layers of clothing on as he goes out in the snow. Well, this is what Peter's saying. You people following Christ and you're coming into church and you've got so many layers of jealousy, envy, uh, meanness, all that kind of stuff, that um, you can't move. You can't worship freely. You can't bring a sacrifice. Right? You're like the kid in Christmas story. And so he says, take off that junk. Drop it. Just get rid of it. You don't need it so that you can be free. I love that image. He's not saying, okay, now do all these zipsy pipsy things correctly. I think because, you know, if we're following Jesus, he'll, he'll lead us into what we should do. But he's saying, you're not going to be doing it if you're all bundled up with this crap. Right? I mean that in the most spiritual sense. That... <laughs> now, it's really funny because th these things may do more to undermine loving relationships than anything we've ever seen. They also tend to derail our beliefs. And it's really weird. I, you know, I've thought about this because I was thought, you know, it's really important what a person believes really more than what they do. You know, because I'm kind of an easygoing guy, right? And so, you know, I, I know you got your issues and stuff, but, you know, as long as you believe in Jesus, that's the important thing. But guess what I've learned? This is really, and, I, and in my own life, over the years, when people have come to me and they've talked to me about stuff and they want to, well, you know, Pastor, I'm really struggling, you know, in my faith right now. I don't know if I really believe it's Jesus and the resurrection. They have these theological questions for me. I used to, when I was really stupid, I used to talk to them about those issues. Right? And not anymore. Because now when they pour out all their questions and their doubts and the things they're struggling with, I usually just say something like, so what's going on in your life new? That's sort of setting you back. Well, I kind of gotten involved with a guy at work, and uh, we kind of started seeing each other a little bit after work and doing stuff together. And now it's kind of become something as, uh, you know, I'm kind of caught up in it, or, or you know, well, I kind of got into some money issues, and I made some decisions and some stuff. Haven't told the family yet about it, but we're, we've gotten ourselves into problems, and I'm trying to fix things by tinkering with it and make it worse, you know. Or, well, I went back to some of my addictions, you know, and putting it up my nose again or whatever. And, uh, you know, they start talking about these things. And I'm going, yeah, you don't have belief issues. You don't have belief issues. You, you, 
our beliefs start to feel unstable when we're doing things that undermine our lives and that set us back. And so that's why Peter's saying, first of all, take off all that junk. Get rid of that so that you can grow and you can relate in loving ways and you can, you can receive love and you can be part of something and your beliefs will be strong. And, uh, and then, because in verse uh, what is it, 8, People stumble because they disobey the message. We don't stumble because we don't believe the message. We stumble because we disobey it. And, and we're not living out the implications of our belief. Now, then he says, you know, we're, after he's dealt with us, take this stuff off. Uh, you know, drop it. Then he said, we're living stones. Now, this week, for the, I never connected this before, but do you remember? It was Peter who Jesus said, uh, his name was Simon at the time, he said, you're Simon. He said, now you are Petra, Rocky. I'm going to call you Rocky from now on. You're a living stone. And on the stone, I'm going to build my church. Now, that's a very profound thing, right? The church is going to be built on this living stone, Peter. Now, I'm wondering, so Peter, through his life, did he ever think about that? What does that mean? What did Jesus mean by that? What am I supposed to do with that? I bet he probably did, right? So now he comes towards the end of his life, and he's writing this letter, and he starts talking about the living stone. The very thing that Christ called him. He said, I'm going to build, build my church and he, and he talks about, um, you come to him, the living stone, Jesus, rejected by people, but chosen by God and precious to him. You also, like living stones, like little rockies, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. What he's saying is, Jesus came to me and said, you're no longer Simon. You are a living stone which I'll build a church. And now he's saying, and guess what, folks? You too are living stones in which the church is built as we are put one on top of another. And we come together and God is building something very profound and very uh, impactful in our world as each of us as living stones are built into this. I love that he takes that, you know, the, the very thing Jesus talk to him about it, and then years later says, no, 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 this is for all of us. We all are, are part of this uh, building. Now, anybody here ever do any um, kind of remodeling, construction -y kind of stuff? <laughs> right, yeah, yeah. What a mess that is. You know, there's great joy in it. And I want you to know we had a 650-pound rock being moved this afternoon by our wonderful drummer. <laughs> yeah. Happy birthday. <laughs> it's a bird bath. But it's 650 pound rock. So um, anyway, the thing is that um, I went down to Guatemala years ago, uh, and we were scouting out mission trips. And we were out on uh, Lake Atilan, which is this huge, beautiful lake. We went to a little village in the back, and we were staying with some Habitat for Humanity people. And they took us out to meet the neighbors who were going to be building their homes. I said, so what do they do to get ready for this? Well, they take about a year, and they make bricks. And they had this little, they showed me how the, the neighbor came out to demonstrate, you know, you put a bunch of sand and stuff in this wooden box and there's a lever and you press down on it and you can compact it and then you put it in the sun. And the, all around the house, everywhere, are these bricks that he, he's been making. And he's made hundreds of them and they're, they're scattered all over the place. Now, here's the thing. He didn't have a house. He had a bunch of bricks spread around. That's really important to know. He worked all year making these fine bricks, and they're all over the place, and they're really good bricks, and they dry in the sun, and they, they become solid, and they don't add up to a house at all. 
He could sit there in the field with all of his bricks that he's been making and his kids have been making and his wife's been making, everybody's been making, neighbors have helped out. There have been hundreds of them. They could sit in that field and it would not be a house. What's it take for it to become a house? There's a step. They got to take the bricks and put them together with mortar and pile them up and frame that. And they got to make the house by bringing the bricks together. Leaving them out in the field, in the sun, drying. That's wonderful. It doesn't equate to a house. And, and we've got this situation where, uh, you know, we've got people, followers of Jesus who, you know, we're living stones and we're sitting out there in the field by ourselves going, isn't this great? Just loving the Lord. This is super unconnected to each other. Unconnected. We haven't been brought together and built into a house. We've not, we're not part of something bigger than ourselves. We're just sitting out in the road. Some of us are 650 pounders, like the one you guys are going to move today. Some of us are much smaller. But we're just sitting around until God and His grace starts putting us together and building us into something holy and meaningful and special. You get that? That's really important to see because... because you know, I'm not proud of the fact that I'm a living stone, and I like doing that by myself. Sitting out there, shining like a stone. <laughs> that doesn't make a church, you know. It just makes West Paul sitting out there by himself. Nice! <laughs> no, it means nothing. Until God brings us together and starts putting us together and, and putting the mortar in that holds us together. And our love relationship is that mortar that holds us together. Our commitment to Christ holds us together. And we become something far bigger than ourselves. And then, as God does this, and he, he, he makes us this holy, holy house... He makes us into a church together. We take on a new identity. And uh, I think all of us have an identity. Because I mean, you have an identity. You have a way of living. The people around you know you, right? And they know you're that way. You know, sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's not. But they know you're that way. And uh, but we get a new identity. And and Peter describes. Some of this new identity, what we're destined for. Verse 9. You are a chosen people. A chosen people. That, that God actually calls us to be members of his body. He calls us to come out of our sitting around in the yard and come together in something special. We're chosen by him. It's not like we go, you know, I'm a rock here in the yard and I think I'm going to make myself into something special. No, you're just still a rock in the yard. But when God chooses you and puts you together in his way, then that's a whole new identity. We're part of something far bigger than ourselves. And then he says you're a royal priesthood. A royal priesthood. That, that we participate with God in setting people free. In, in liberating them from their stuff from their history, from their guilts and shames and whatever. And we, and we participate with God as royal priests to, to unleash them, help them experience life in a whole new way. That's what being a royal priest is. It means that we've got direct access with God. That's what the priest has, right? It means that, that, that we're interceding for people, helping people. Find God as we, as we reach out into their lives. Care for them. Um, you're a royal priesthood. But two weeks ago, we ordained uh, Jana here, right? Mm -hmm. We talked about how she was chosen, you know, a special minister. But remember what I said. Everything we're saying to her in this sermon, it means all of us. Because we're all a royal priesthood. And we're all, we're all in ministry together. And then, he says, you're a holy nation. Um, uh, Ephesians. Paul's writing in Ephesians. This Bible is just about to the point where I can't find anything. There we go. Ephesians 2. 
He says, consequently, he said, uh, through whom we both have access to, to the Father by the Holy Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple of the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. I love that. We're no longer aliens. We're no longer strangers, foreigners. We're part of something. We're, we're a holy nation. We're, we're a new people that God has brought together. And it gives us our identity. It gives us our, our stature. It, it gives us our connections. So that's, that's who you are. And then finally, it says you're a people that belongs to God. You're a people that uh, belonging to God. That's your identity. Not no longer just a person belonging to God. You are now a people belonging to God. And uh, he said, at one time, there was no people, and now there's people of God. At one time, you didn't know mercy, now you know mercy. In, in other words, God is acting and creating again, out of nothing, right? So there was no mercy in your life. Now you have mercy in your life because of, of God's incredible love for you. Once there was no people, you were just a living stone sitting in the backyard, sitting there. And now you are part of something bigger. You belong to God together. See, that's profound. Uh, and that, that God would create out of nothing and we would become his church. Not by anything we do, in fact, the only thing we're asked to do, we're only told to do one thing. What's that? Get out of that Christmas story wardrobe. That stuff you're carrying around, the things that are covering you. You know, jealousy, envy, uh, all that kind of stuff. Bad mouth of the people around you. Drop that. So that you can be the living stones that God's pulling together and building his creation. You belong to him. Does that make sense? That's you know when I think about it for myself and and for um, for us as a church, I'm kind of excited because I go, God's not done with us yet. You know, He's gathering us up like living stones, and we're doing fine. You know, scattering around and sitting around and, and shining for His glory. Some nice little nice little stones out there, but pretty soon He's going to do something. He's going to pull us together in a way that uh, goes way beyond what we think. I'm excited to see that happen and uh, look forward to it. Look forward to being uh, cemented with you. Yeah, I know that may make you uncomfortable, but you know, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> if you need to, you can be a part of the wall that's further away from me. That's all right, too. You know. <laughs> all right. Hey, let's stand. Let's, let's pray together and uh, thank you for your um, attendant worship today. So, Lord Jesus. Give us the courage to recognize our own stuff that we've been covered with. And give us the courage to throw it aside. And just leave it. Just leave it so you can have your way in us. And so, Lord, um, take us as we are and pull us together for your glory. And uh, we look forward to seeing how you build your church. And, uh, and we give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.